Listening to music whilst we study is something that we've all done. Sometimes it feels like the only thing that's keeping our sanity together. But could it be that the music that we're listening to, instead of just motivating us, is actually slowing down our learning? Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name's Shane and I'm a doctor and neuroscience supervisor at Oxford University. And today we're going to look at the impact of background music on learning. Let's first begin by getting a lay of the land and look at the evidence generally. Is it good, bad or irrelevant? Some studies found no effect of background music, others found that it negatively impacted learning outcomes and other studies actually found a positive impact on learning, especially on students with learning difficulties or poor spelling skills. Now why could this be? Well, it's possible that each of these studies used very different types of music. It's been shown reliably that tempo and intensity of music has an impact on learning. For example, only soft fast music has a positive influence, whilst loud fast, loud slow and soft slow music actually hinders learning. On top of this, it was found that instrumental music disturbed students less than music with lyrics. So the different music used in each of these studies could account for the contradictory findings. Crucially, what this tells us is that it's not the music itself that impacts learning, but it's the effect music has on us that drives our learning outcomes. This has been explained by three different theoretical approaches. The Mozart effect, the arousal mood hypothesis, and finally, the seductive detail hypothesis. The first two try to provide a theoretical explanation of why music could have a positive impact on learning, whilst the last argues that it has a negative impact. Let's now dive a bit deeper and look at each of these theories in turn. The first and most popular theory is known as the Mozart effect. Before I explain this theory, let's look at the study that led to it. So, in this study, participants were required to complete a task that measured their spatial abilities. Before starting the task, some participants listened to a Mozart sonata, and others didn't listen to any background music. It was found that the participants in the Mozart group outperformed those who didn't listen to any music. The authors claimed to have found a direct positive influence of the Mozart sonata on spatial abilities. They explained these better results through the priming effect of music, meaning that the Mozart music primed their brains to be better at solving spatial abstract reasoning tasks. Now let's look at another theory that criticizes the Mozart effect and offers a slightly different explanation. The next theory is known as the arousal mood hypothesis. It argues that listening to background music doesn't have a direct influence on cognitive abilities, but instead it has an impact through two mediating factors, arousal and mood. In other words, it argues that music influences arousal and mood, which then impacts our cognitive abilities and therefore learning outcomes. To derive this theory, a modified version of the previous experiment was done. In this version, authors recorded a Mozart sonata and then edited it to produce four versions that varied in tempo, either fast or slow, and mode, either major or minor. Participants then listened to a single version of the sonata and completed a spatial reasoning task, whilst also providing a rating of their mood and arousal. They found that participants performed better after listening to music with a fast tempo rather than a slow one, and this correlated with changes in arousal rating. This led the authors to argue that the faster tempo elevated arousal to the optimal level, allowing individuals to perform better. There actually is a plausible basis for this. Arousal, also known as physiological activation, is just a fancy term for how pumped you are. And it has a well-established link to background music, in particular, its tempo. In the same way, arousal also has a strong link to learning, which is famously described by the U-shaped yerkes dodson curve, which states that an optimal level of arousal results in an optimal level of learning. Too much or too little arousal and your learning declines. So it's easy to see the theoretical sense behind music influencing your arousal, which then influences your learning outcomes. Similarly, they also found participants perform better at the spatial task when they listen to music in a major rather than a minor mode, which then also correlated with changes in mood ratings. This led the authors to argue that major modes resulted in in more positive mood, which then enhanced learning outcomes. Again, there's a plausible basis for this. Several studies have found that background music influences mood, and other studies have found that mood influences our learning outcomes. Generally, positive mood is associated with better learning and test performance, whilst negative mood hinders our learning. So again, it's easy to see the theoretical sense that background music influences our mood which can then influence our learning outcomes. Next, let's look at a completely contradictory theory that'll make you think twice before listening to music whilst you study. 
the seductive detail hypothesis offers an explanation as to how background music can actually have a negative impact on learning. It suggests that whilst you're learning with background music, you have to divide your cognitive resources between listening to the music and actually learning. And as auditory information always gets processed first and cannot be ignored, it steals some of the cognitive resources available, meaning that there is less to go around for your learning tasks. So it's not surprising that a meta-analysis of the influence of background music found an overall negative impact of music on learning. Music essentially becomes an unnecessary extra burden on something known as working memory, which is a crucial point because this working memory is both limited and vital for learning. Let's now take a closer look at working memory and music to understand this better. Firstly, what exactly is working memory? Well, it's defined as a cognitive system with a limited capacity that can temporarily hold and manipulate information. Think of it as a form of short-term memory where information isn't just stored, but is kept alive for higher order cognitive processing, such as decision-making and learning. There are quite a few theories on how working memory is organized, but the most popular is by Badley and Hitch. This theory proposes a model containing three key components. The central executive, the phonological loop, and the visual spatial sketchpad. The central executive functions as a source of control center, directing attention and information between the two subcomponents. The phonological loop processes, stores, and keeps alive auditory information, such as speech, music, and red material. The visual spatial sketchpad does the same thing, but for color, shape, spatial, and haptic information. At first glance, it may seem that reading, which is a visual stimulus, gets processed by the visual spatial sketchpad. However, reading actually involves converting the written words into sounds via a subvocal process. Or in other words, your inner voice converts the written material into sounds, which then gets processed, stored, and kept alive by the phonological loop and not the visual spatial sketchpad. Now, this presents a problem because an important feature of working memory is that it's limited. And each of the subsystems, the phonological loop and the visual spatial sketchpad have their own limited capacity. So if different tasks use the same component of working memory, then that subsystem will become overloaded, impairing both tasks. As a result, when you listen to background music and reading something, they both use the phonological loop and therefore they both impair each other. Following on from this theory, it would make sense that music with lyrics would be worse than instrumental music. This is because the lyrics need to be additionally processed, which would add to the work of the phonological loop, leading to a larger decrease in learning performance compared to instrumental music. In any case, the take home from this theory is that listening to background music steals some of the cognitive resources, meaning less is available for learning. But there's one more piece of the puzzle to explore. The last thing to address is the material that's being learned. Each of the theories and experiments we've seen so far have used their own measure of learning or cognitive performance. But of course, we all know from personal experience there's lots of different types of learning, each varying in its complexity and demands. But at the most fundamental level, we can split learning outcomes into recall and comprehension. Recall tasks are thought to be simpler and use up less of the working memory capacity. Comprehension tasks, on the other hand, are thought to be a little bit more complex, requiring a greater aspect of working memory. So background music, which as we've seen, limits working memory, should impact comprehension more than recall. Now let's look at some experimental evidence that's tested out all three of these theories at the same time. But before we begin, let's have a look at the four main hypotheses generated by all the information we've seen so far. Background music shouldn't influence recall, but does affect comprehension. Due to the Mozart effect, comprehension should be directly and positively influenced by background music. Due to the arousal mood hypothesis, arousal and mood should be related to music and learning outcomes. And finally, on the basis of the seductive detail effect, there should be a direct negative influence of background music on comprehension. To test these hypotheses, participants were asked to complete pretests 
on arousal, mood, as well as a test for prior knowledge of a topic that would be learnt and then tested. Following this, the learning phase took place, where participants were required to place on some headsets and then to start that track. For one half of the participants, the instructions were to start and stop learning with silence in between. For the other half of the participants, it was the same instructions, but instead, two songs played in between starting and stopping learning. The songs chosen were instrumental music with fast tempo played at a medium volume, designed to induce a positive mood. The reading material that had to be learned was a visual text on time and date differences on Earth that was around 1,070 words long. After the learning phase, the participants completed the arousal and mood questionnaires again to measure any changes. Then they completed an exam which tested their learning. The test consisted of five open-ended recall questions, like for example, according to which principles were the time zones classified, and five open-ended comprehension questions, like for example, what time is it in Frankfurt when it's 2 p.m. in Mexico City? Finally, the participants' working memory capacity was tested using a computer-based task. Here are the main findings. It was found that background music had no effect on mood or arousal scores. Now, as you might have picked up, this is directly in contradiction to the arousal mood hypothesis. Why could this be? Well, for one, it could be that the arousal mood hypothesis is wrong. Or it could be that the time span during which participants were exposed to the music was too short for it to have an impact. Learning phases in everyday life is usually much longer than in the experiment, and learners may normally be exposed to music for longer periods. So it might be the case that it's necessary to listen to music for a longer period to influence mood and arousal. Thirdly, the tools used to measure arousal and mood might not have been sensitive enough to pick up the small changes. To remedy this, in the future, further studies need to use more sensitive continuous scales and possibly even objective measures of arousal, for example, measures of blood pressure, heart rate, and skin conductance, which all act as objective measures of arousal. Fourthly, it could be that the specific background music use simply doesn't affect mood or arousal in this learning context. It could be that the songs used just didn't fit with the music taste of the participants. For example, if some of the participants enjoyed the music and therefore had a positive impact on their mood, and the other participants didn't enjoy the music and therefore had a negative impact on their mood, then the effects of one another would cancel out. In any case, what we can say is that from this experiment, no evidence was found to support the arousal mood hypothesis. The next finding was that background music didn't affect recall performance. This could mean that the positive effect proposed by the Mozart effect and the negative effects proposed by the seductive detail hypothesis either do not happen or cancel each other out. This could possibly mean that listening to background music whilst performing a relatively simple recall task only places a small burden on working memory. And there's still enough working memory capacity left over after listening to the background music to spend on completing the simpler recall task. Okay, so what about the more complex comprehension task? Well, Interestingly, it was found that participants who didn't listen to the background music during the learning phase actually performed better at the comprehension tasks. This actually fits with the seductive detail hypothesis, which argues that background music uses up some of the cognitive resources, meaning that less is available to complete comprehension tasks. The final finding of this study was that there was a significant interaction between listening to background music and working memory capacity. Specifically, it was found that participants with the lowest working memory capacity reached higher comprehension scores when not listening to any background music. The author suggests that those with low working memory capacity are simply not able to process both the background music and the comprehension task simultaneously. Obviously, there's lots of limitations to consider here. We've already discussed some, such as measurement tools and the length of listening. Other things to consider are things like motivation and interest of the learning topic and enjoyment of songs. So, what does all of this mean to you and me? Well, based on the studies we've seen, there's some evidence that listening to music while studying won't do you any harm. 
but there's actually a lot more circumstances where it impairs your learning. So here are my take homes and things that I personally do. If I'm learning to understand something, especially if it's hard, I don't listen to any background music. If I'm getting bored or distracted by loud noises or people speaking, then I might listen to some instrumental music or sounds like waves or rainfall at a medium level of volume. However, if I'm doing a simpler task where I just have to recall information or it's a task that I'm very familiar with, then I would listen to any type of music particularly favoring those with fast tempo and in a major mode. I'll leave links below to my favorite playlists. If you'd like to find out more about how I went about finding all this information and then pulling together a narrative with critical analysis of evidence, then you might like to check out this playlist. Or if you'd like a more systematic way of learning this, then you might like to check out my essay writing masterclass by clicking on the link below. But that's it from me for today. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you again next time.